Welcome to everyone. We're glad you're here. Uh, the Gonzaga Socratic Club is inspired by C.S. Lewis. It's named after the Oxford Socratic Club, uh, which was an organization that C.S. Lewis presided over. C.S. Lewis, hang on a second. I, I should have planned this a little better, but I didn't. So, uh, do you want my uh, I'd have to look it up and it would have to think. So let's, just, <laughs> let's trust the technology we've been doing at this point. Uh, Lewis was born 115 years ago, but today we celebrate the 50 year anniversary of his death on this day in 1963, November 22nd. In doing so, we join celebrations across the globe including his home academic universities of Oxford and, at the very end of his life, Cambridge, Christian universities such as Baylor University, and multiple news sites such as PBS, The Guardian, USA Today. It's interesting, if you do a web search now on C.S. Lewis anniversary death, all kinds of news stories pop up. A lot of uh, news outlets have been talking about this. We also join a very distinguished company of uh, folks that gathered at Westminster Abbey today to uh, dedicate a memorial stone to C.S. Lewis in Poets' Corner. Uh, very interesting. It's got a quote from Lewis. I believe in Christianity and I believe um, that the sun is risen not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Lovely quote from Lewis. Uh, again, excuse me here. Lewis is perhaps best known for, best remembered for, the uh, Chronicles of Narnia series, and therefore he's known as a Christian author, especially a Christian author of children's books. In addition, several generations of Christians appreciate Lewis as an apologist, author of books such as Mere Christianity and the Problem of Pain and also of more devotional Christian books, such as The Weight of Glory. Uh, but Lewis was not limited by being a children's author and a Christian author. He also wrote science fiction, which seems very odd. I mean, if you know about Lewis from the Narnia stories, you probably think science fiction. Yes, in fact, in fact, one of our speakers will be talking about that later. Uh, here also wrote uh, fiction that was specifically targeted for adult readers and as a scholar in Oxford University and Cambridge University, literary criticism and academic uh, literary scholarship. Perhaps the most famous quote that Lewis is known for, indeed, if people know very little about Lewis, uh, they probably know this quote uh, in Mere Christianity where he's making the case for Christ as an answer to the moral law, our sense that there is a moral structure to the universe. And Lewis famously offers a trichotomy in response to folks who say that we should embrace Lewis as a moral teacher, but reject his status as, uh, as God, as divine. Lewis says famously, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Yes, that's supposed to be funny. You're permitted to <laughs> you, must, you must make a choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Now, uh, there have been a lot of critics of this trichotomy argument. And it's fair to say that, I mean, some of the critics even are friendly critics, uh, such as N.T. Wright, a uh, well-known theologian. Uh, who have argued that it doesn't address um, the direction that uh, biblical studies and biblical criticism has taken since Lewis's time. Because, of course, atheists, atheist skeptics and critics will 
uh, in our day say, well, there are many more than the three options of, line of, uh, of uh, liar, lunatic, and lord. There's, for example, maybe the, maybe the early church just made all of this up, right? We have to address that. Um, but I think we can see that what Lewis is really saying is he's saying every generation has to confront the question of who Christ is. I just went to a conference on Kierkegaard a couple of weeks ago, and even though I don't know that Lewis anywhere talks about Kierkegaard, uh, in, in the famous tri tripotomy argument, he's really posing a deeply Kierkegaardian question. What are you going to do with Jesus and the claims that he makes? Um, Oh, okay, <laughs> wonderful, look at that. Technology is grand. Uh, we can see what Lewis would say, I think, if we update the trichotomy argument by looking at an argument that we find in the silver chair. There, the main characters, uh, the well-known Eustace from uh, the guy who deserved the name he had, if you remember, at the beginning of the White John Chair, and Joe Paul and the Marsh Wiggle Puddle Glum find themselves uh, trapped in Underland, where they are under the enchantment of the Lady of the Green Kirtle, who turns out to be a witch, after all. Uh, she makes a, a, a very interesting argument that all of our intimations, all of our sense of a world beyond this world, are merely imaginary. We have no reason to believe any of that. And what we find in the response of the glum Marsh Wiggle, Puddle Glum, uh, who's always complaining about how bad things are, is, uh, is the declaration of what a Christian can and should say in the post-Christian scientific reductionistic world. And this is what he, this is what he has to say. Suppose, uh, in response, the queen has been saying they're under an enchantment, there's a, there's a spell burning with a fire in the fireplace, and she's thrumming on this harp, and, and singing them to sleep into a kind of stupor. And, uh, and finally, Puddle Glum breaks the enchantment by sticking his foot in the fire, and the smell of burnt Puddle Glum, of burnt uh, marsh wiggle, uh, uh, stinks up the room, and it breaks the enchantment. And Puddle Glum says this, suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. The queen, the witch, has said that all the things they remember from the land outside of Underland is, is all imaginary, all a dream. Suppose we have dreamed all of this, then all I can say is that in that case the made up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, uh, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your wor real world hollow. That's why I'm going to stand for the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as a Narnian even if there isn't any Narnia. Now, I think we have to be careful to note that Puddle Glum and Lewis are not saying that we should just make up a world and believe in it. There's a technical term for that, fideism, just believism, or something to that effect. Uh, because ultimately, fideism is deluded and unsustainable. I think what Lewis is showing us in the voice of this rather uh, rather staid, rather uh, unimaginative, rather plain marsh wiggle, is that we should be alive to the enchantment of imagination that can awaken us to and point us in the direction of truth. And so what we're going to do today is celebrate Lewis as an author who awakens us with enchantment. We have a panel, uh, an illustrious panel of five speakers, four here present with us today, and one uh, present uh, uh, in the corner there, you can see here, present from Chicago. So uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Forrest Baird of Whitworth University, and he'll be addressing the Pilgrim's Regress. Let's welcome Dr. Forrest Baird. Thank you. So, um, I grew up in inner city L.A., and 
When I was a kid, um, there were days when it was clear enough that I could see Griffith Park Observatory. Uh, not every day, but some days I could. And somehow, I got it in my head that God lived up there. Now, I'm just a boy. I, I don't know why, but somehow it just seemed that I, I had to get there. If I could just get there, everything would be right. I, I, it was a painful desire to get to Griffith Park Observatory. So I bugged my parents and I bugged my parents and eventually they took me there and they got all kinds of cool things and displays and so forth. But of course I was also a little disappointed. Um, but from the balcony, this is up on the balcony, in the distance I could see Palos Verdes Peninsula. And I had that same feeling, if I could just get over there to Palos Verdes Peninsula, life would be full. So I bugged my parents and I bugged my parents, <laughs> and eventually they took me to Palos Verdes Peninsula. And at that time, they still had a place called Marine Land, and it had, you know, the dolphin show and the killer whale and all that kind of stuff. And it was kind of cool, but it was really disappointing because <laughs> it didn't fulfill that longing that I had. But as we were leaving, in the distance, I could see <laughs> Catalina Island. Now, my guess is many of you have had an experience like this. And it was when I was in college, I happened to across a, uh, a book by C.S. Lewis called Pilgrim's Regress. I'm actually not a huge fan of the book itself. But the preface to it just hit me right between the eyes. And I want to read to you from that preface and put a few of the key phrases up here on the screen for you. There is a particular recurrent experience which dominated my childhood and adolescence and which I hastily called romantic because inanimate nature and marvelous literature were among the things that evoked it. I still believe the experience is common, commonly misunderstood and of immense importance. It is distinguished from other longings by two things. In the first place, though the sense of want is acute and even painful, yet the mere wanting is felt to be somehow a delight. In fact, Lewis came to call it Zeinzug, which is this German word that means a kind of bittersweet longing. Other desires are felt as pleasures only if satisfaction is expected in the near future. Hunger is pleasant only while we know or believe that we are soon going to eat. Many of you, this coming Thursday, will probably have that experience where you don't eat for a while, but you know you're going to have a big feast for Thanksgiving. And that hunger is part of the enjoyment. But this desire, this desire, even when there's no hope of possible satisfaction, continues to be prized and even to be preferred to anything else in the world by those who have once felt it. This hunger is better than any other fullness. This poverty better than all other wealth. And thus it comes about that if the desire is long absent, it may itself be desired. And that new desiring becomes a new instance of the original desire, though the subject may not at once recognize the fact, and thus cries out for his lost youth of soul at the very moment in which he is being rejuvenated. Now, this sounds complicated, but it's simple when we live it. Oh, to feel as I did then. Some of you probably think this around Christmas. Oh, I remember how Christmas used to be so great and I look forward to it now. It's just, I have to get all these things on this list taken care of. Oh, if only I could be a kid again. What happens though is we don't notice that even while we say the words, the very feeling whose loss we lament is rising again in all its old bittersweetness. For this sweet desire cuts across our ordinary distinctions between wanting and having. To have it is by definition a want. To want it, we find, is to have it. In the second place, there's a peculiar mystery about the object of this desire. Inexperienced people, and inattention leads some inexperienced all their lives, suppose when they feel it that they know what they are desiring. Thus, if it comes to a child and he's looking at a far-off hillside, <laughs> he at once thinks, oh, if only I were there. If it comes when he's remembering some event in the past, he thinks, oh, if only I could go back to those days. 
If it comes a little later when he's reading a romantic tale or poem of perilous seas and fairy lands, fairy lands forlorn, he thinks he is wishing that such places really existed and he could reach them. Don't you just wish you could ride on Aslan's back? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> if it comes later still in a context with erotic suggestions, he believes he is desiring the perfect beloved. If it falls upon literature, which treats of spirits in the light, he thinks that he is hankering for real magic and occultism. When it darts out upon him from his studies in history or science, he may confuse it with the intellectual craving for knowledge. But every one of these impressions is wrong. Every one of the supposed desires is inadequate. Every supposed inadequate is, every supposed object is inadequate. An easy experiment will show that if you could go to the far hillside, either get nothing or else a recurrence of the same desire which sent you thither. It's exactly what I did as a kid. Same desire growing up. A rather more difficult but still possible study of your own memories will prove that by returning to the past, you could not find as a possession that ecstasy which some sudden reminder of the past now moves you to desire. It appeared to me, therefore, that if a man diligently followed this desire, pursuing the false objects until their falsity appeared, and then resolutely abandoning them, he must come out at last into the clear knowledge that the human soul was made to enjoy some object that is never fully given. In fact, can't even be imagined as given in our present mode of subjective space-time experience. This desire was in the soul as the siege perilous in Arthur's castle, the chair in which only one could sit. By the way, there's a, several versions of the siege perilous in King Arthur's King Arthur stories, but I think the one Lewis was thinking of here, there's a story that when, uh, before he was king, uh, he was known as Wart, and Arthur goes into this room, he's looking for a sword for his knight brother, and as he goes into this room, he's just exhausted, and there's a chair sitting over there. Now the chair was the siege perilous, and the only person who could sit in there was the rightful king of all Britain. If anybody else sat in that chair, they would die immediately. And Wart, who is exhausted, goes over and flops down in the chair. There's nobody else there, so he doesn't worry about anybody seeing him. He doesn't know what the chair is. And he's fine. Nothing happens. Now, he isn't actually alone. Merlin is over in a corner watching all this. And the reason he's fine is because he is the rightful king of all Britain. He just doesn't know it yet not until he pulls the sword out of the stone and so forth. What Lewis is saying here is there is some kind of a desire in us and we keep trying to put things in there and everything we put in there dies on us. We think what we want is money or success or power and it just dies on us. Because, of course, what we really want is something else. And then he makes this interesting little argument from analogy. And if nature makes nothing in vain, the one, capital O, who can sit in this chair must exist. I knew only too well how easily the longing accepts false objects and through what dark ways the pursuit of them leads us. But I also saw that the desire itself contains the corrective of all these errors. The only fatal error was to pretend that you would pass from desire to fruition, when in reality you had found either nothing or desire itself or the satisfaction of some different desire. The dialectic of desire faithfully followed would retrieve all mistakes, head you off from all false paths. This lived dialectic and the merely argued dialectic of my philosophical progress seemed to have converged on one goal. Accordingly, I tried to put them both in my allegory, which thus became a defense of romanticism in my peculiar sense, as well as of reason and Christianity. Here's the argument that Lewis is making. He is saying, look, we experience thirst, so we conclude that we're creatures who need water to exist, to survive. We experience hunger. I mentioned that earlier. So we are creatures that need food to survive. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to get either one of them, but from the desire, we can draw that conclusion. 
we experience a longing for something not available in the natural world. And everything we try to put in that place dies on us. By analogy, he says, unless nature is just fooling us, we are creatures made to experience something supernatural. Because, of course, what this desire really is, is the hungering and thirsting after God. Thank you. Our second speaker is Dr. Jennifer Mills, uh, who is a teacher of communications at Moody Bible Institute here in Spokane. She will speak on Voyage of the John Treader.
talking with Edmund. He says, well, anyway, I looked up and saw the very last thing I expected, a huge lion coming slowly toward me. And one clear thing was there was no moon last night, and there was moonlight where the lion was. Um, I got it. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> so it came nearer and nearer. I was terribly afraid of it. You may think that, being a dragon, I could have knocked any lion out easily enough, but it wasn't that kind of fear. I wasn't afraid of it eating me. I was afraid of it, if you can understand. Well, it came close up to me and looked straight into my eyes. And I shut my eyes tight, but that wasn't any good because it told me to follow it. You think so? I don't know. Now you, that you mention it, I don't think it did, but it told me all the same. And I knew I'd have to do what it told me, so I got to follow it. And it led me a long way into the mountains, and there was always this moonlight over and around the line wherever we went. So at last we came to the top of a mountain I'd never seen before, and on the top of this mountain there was a garden, trees and fruit and everything, and in the middle of it there was a well. I knew it was a well because you could see the water bubbling up from the bottom of it, but it was a lot bigger than most wells, like a very big round bath with marble steps going down into it. The water was as clear as anything, and I thought if I could get in there and bathe, it would ease the pain in my leg. But the lion told me I must undress first. Mind you, I don't know if he said any words out loud or not. I was just going to say that I couldn't undress because I hadn't any clothes on, and when suddenly I thought that dragons are snaky sorts of things and snakes can cast their skins. Oh, of course, thought I, that's what the lion means. So I started scratching myself, and my skills began coming off all over the place. And then I scratched a little deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully, like it does after an illness, or as if I was a banana. In a minute or two, I just stepped out of it. I could see it lying there beside me, looking rather nasty. It was the most lovely feeling. So I started to go down into the well and wait. But just as I was going to put my feet into the water, I looked down and saw that they were all hard and rough and wrinkled and scaly, just as they had been before. Oh, that's all right, said I. It only means I had another smaller suit on underneath the first one, and I'll just get out of it, too. So I scratched and tore again, and this underskin peeled off beautifully. And out I stepped and left lying beside the other one and went down to the well for my bathe. Well, exactly the th same thing happened again. And I thought to myself, oh dear, however many skins have I got to take off? For I was longing to bathe my leg. So I scratched away for the third time and got off the third skin, just like the two others, and stepped out of it. But as soon as I looked at myself in the water, I knew it had been measured. Then the lion said, but I don't know if he spoke. You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now, so I just lay down flat on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart, and when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked this guy off the store place, <laughs> It hurts like Billio, but it is fun to see it coming away. I know exactly what you mean, said Edmund. <laughs> well, I peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, as smooth and soft as this field switch and smaller than I had been. And he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, I was very tender underneath, and I had no skin on and threw me into the water. I sparted out like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious, and as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone through my arm, and then I saw why. I turned me into a boy.
tradition, we celebrate the lives of the saints. Saints are those uh, people who have lived lives of exemplary virtue. We celebrate their lives on the day that they died, not their birthday like you might expect. Uh, so today we could consider to be uh, Lewis's feast day. And I can't think of a better way to celebrate his feast day than by reading out loud his works in a community like this and thanking him for it. So thanks, Dr. Kaplan, for setting this up and for uh, making all the technology work so that I could be here. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to uh, reference two works. Um, and this is why. Um, as a librarian, I'm interested in childhood development. And as a philosophical person, I'm interested in how reading plays into a child's moral development. And Lewis has an excellent essay on that. It's called, uh, well, not on just that. It's on education and relativism. And it's called The Abolition of Man. This is my library's kind of beat up copy. Uh, and it's a great essay, and I love it very much. I bet you guys are familiar with it, too. But it's so well-crafted and nuanced that if you try to take just one sentence out of it, it's like pulling on yarn in a bag that's been knit. And pretty soon, you've got the whole thing unraveled on your lap, and you're like, what am I going to do with this? Uh, so you can't read it in isolation. Uh, so what I'm going to do is summarize just a very small portion of the argument. And then I am going to uh, read a passage from Prince Caspian, another part of the Narnia. And hopefully by then, uh, you will understand why they fit together. Everything OK so far, sound-wise? Yes. OK. Here we go. So Lewis wrote The Abolition of Man in response to an educational philosophy that it was in vogue at the time. It was in 1943. And that philosophy said that education ought to strip men down of their sentimental response to things so that they could make decisions based on reason. But they defined reason very, very narrowly. Uh, the whole thing was kind of a, an amateur knockoff of evolutionary ethics. So they're defining um, reason as only those things which can be proved uh, through the physical sciences kind of a, a scientific reductionist view of uh, the world. We can only have certainty about things that we proved through science, um, so we ought to look towards the physical sciences like biology for the foundation of important things like ethics. Uh, so an evolutionary ethics kind of view of emotion is that it's something that evolved in response to our um, surroundings, uh, and that it doesn't really have any correspondence, uh, I don't know, reality? We'll, we'll go at it from this angle. Um, you might think that the reason you do a good thing like feed your children is because you love your children. That's the emotion part, right? And you might think that you love your children because your children are worthy of love. They're, they're lovable. Uh, but an evolutionary ethicist would say, well, no, actually, love is a biochemical response that evolved um, in, in response to our environment um, and helps motivate us to feed our children. But it's not because they're worthy of love. It's because we need to preserve the species. It's a, a survival instinct that we've got inside of us. So the educational philosophy that Lewis is responding to is saying, uh, we need to cut through kind of these sentimental things um, and guide our actions by reason, um, and reason defined very, very narrowly in scientific reduction terms, um, and use things like the physical sciences as a foundation for a new kind of ethics that kind of throws out those traditional foundations and just um, goes for things that we can know with the certainty that it comes from science. There are lots of philosophic problems with that argument. Um, even actually early, um, early evolutionary ethicists might not have gone quite the direction that uh, Lewis's opponents, who refers to them as dynastitian, um, went because it's hard to get an ought, uh, a way you ought to act um, from the is of, of evolution. Uh, but we're not going to be able to go into all of that. But if you're interested in how Lewis answers all of those, why, then you should go visit a library, shouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are top visits in every librarian's book, and so you should uh, check it out there. So instead, we're going to turn our attention to the educational philosophy that Lewis Hell holds up uh, kind of in contrast to this. 
So one thing you might notice about Lewis's opponent's argument is that there are some parts of it that sound very appealing to us. If you leave out that kind of a reductionist claim a little bit, uh, the idea that you should use your reason to decide what to do sounds like a very good idea. Um, and I think that part of the reason it's so appealing to us is that uh, the, the pendulum of fads in education has kind of swung back a few times. So we might be more accustomed to responding to ideas that sort of came from the, the legacy of the 60s and the 70s, right? Um, if it feels good, do it. So Lewis is talking to people who are saying you need to cut out your heart because it's um, silly. And we're more used to responding to people saying, well, you should listen to your heart even if it contradicts what your head says. Um, but Lewis's response is good for both of those, so we'll go to that now. Uh, Lewis takes his model from the classical philosophic tradition. So he's appealing to people like Plato and Aristotle and subsequent thinkers like Stenogaster. And in their view of the universe, there are things out there that are actually worthy of love by their nature. Your children call out loving response from you, or they should, if you're a properly functioning human being, um, because they are, in fact, worthy of love. And things are worthy of love or of admiration or of kind of a positive response for us um, because they participate in kind of this, this cosmic this, um, from when uh, our illustrious president of Gonzaga was Father Spitzer, he used to give a talk a lot about five transcendental good things that were good in and of themselves. So that would mean they're not good because they're useful to us. Um, they're good just just as they are, even, even if they weren't useful to us, they would be good. I mean, they are useful to us, but their goodness is just in their, their being. Um, and he would count those things out as uh, being, truth, love, goodness, and beauty. And in uh, the Christian tradition and in Platonic tradition, all of those things end up being one thing. So in the Christian tradition, that thing is God, and Platonic is kind of a big, massive form. Uh, and what that means is that if you see something beautiful, perfectly beautiful, you are also seeing something perfectly true. And you are also seeing something perfectly good. And those kinds of things, things in the world that are a little bit like the perfect goodness and the perfect truth, they are worthy of love. And so they call out in us a response of awe or uh, of desire uh, because they're worthy in and of themselves. Ah. Where are we going from here? <laughs> so, in Lewis's educational philosophy, the goal is not to kind of cut out the emotional responses that you have when you look at things. The goal is to train those emotional responses to be directed at things that are really good and really worthy of love. Um, so, a child might start out um, really wanting to reach for fire. Um, but that thing is really not, not worthy of um, going after. And so a child needs to be trained not to, to want or desire that thing. Their emotion, their desires need to be shaped in accordance with the way that things really are in the world. Some things are really good for you to reach for, some things not so much. And because good things and beautiful things and true things are all one thing, Lewis and Plato and uh, St. Augustine say that if a child is trained to love a beautiful thing, they will later be able to recognize a good thing. Or if a child is trained to love a good thing, then when a true thing comes knocking, they will recognize that as something that they should love too. And this happens long before the age of reason. You can love something long before you can understand something. So now we'll, I'll give you a little bit of my background with Lewis. Uh, if I were to put my life into ethics, uh, the first little section of my life would be the years of reading. And that was the era when my sister Karen and I, I was about five years old, uh, would spend what felt like all day, although I'm sure it wasn't all day, uh, 
listening to my mom read, who would be snuggled in on either side of her in the big bed while she nursed my sister Clara. And she would read out loud to us, and that was where I first met C.S. Lewis through his Narnia Chronicles. I was five years old. My reason was not functioning at the high level that it functions at now. <laughs> but I was ready to learn to love, and I was ready to learn what was worthy of love. And I had the great fortune of hearing Lewis again as I matured. I have a very large family. We tended to have a child about every five years. Five years is a good age for sitting down and still listening to something. So inevitably, about the time that a child was about five years old, there was also a new child who needed to be fed. And so then mom would read books again. And I had this renewed exposure as my reason grew over and over to the beauty and the truths that Lewis puts in his Narnia Chronicles. So long before I was rational, I was learning to love beauty and goodness and the fantasy that he presented. And then later on, as I heard it in my older years and could understand more, when truth came knocking at my door, I could recognize it. We were already friends, because I had already met Aslan. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Lucy woke out of the deepest sleep you can imagine with the feeling that the voice she liked best had called her name. She thought at first it was her father's voice, but that did not seem quite right. Then she thought it was Peter's voice, but that did not seem to fit. She got up, her heart beating wildly, and she walked through the glade encircled by trees. She soon got through them, half wondering whether she had been using her arms to push branches aside or to take hands in a green chain with big dancers who stooped to reach her, for they were really a ring of trees around a central open place. She stepped out from among their shifting confusion of lovely lights and shadows. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes, with dark trees dancing all around it. And then, oh joy, for he was there, the huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, with his huge black shadow. But for the movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion, but Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew was that she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy, at last. The great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell, half sitting, half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched the nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her. She gazed up into its large, wide face. Welcome, he said.
The conflict between good and evil is played out in England and the setting of contemporary academia and the powerful National Institute of Coordinated Experiments, acronym NICE. <laughs> Mark and Jane Studdick are a young married couple who live in the village of Cure Party. He is a sociologist whose vanity and ambition have led him into NICE, where men named Litter and Frost are key players. The passage you will hear follows after the totalitarian agenda of NICE has been disclosed to Mark, and milder forms of persuasion have failed to enlist him absolutely. Imprisoned in a cell, without food, tormented with the fear of death, he has at last decided to pretend to join them in order to save his life. In order to include both the intellectual and experiential temptations of Mark, I have edited the passage. One caveat, at the end, Mark uses the word scientific in the sense that Wither and Frost would use it, not the way the church would use it. Professor Frost came to ask if he had thought over their recent conversation. Mark, who judged that some decent show of reluctance would make his final surrender more convincing, replied that only one thing was still troubling him. He saw clearly that the motives on which most men act, and which they dignify by the names of patriotism or duty to humanity, were mere products of the animal organism, varying according to the behavior pattern of different communities. But he did not yet see what was to be substituted for these irrational motives. On what ground, henceforward, were actions to be justified or condemned? If one insists on putting the question in those terms, said Frost, I think Waddington has given the best answer. Existence is its own justification. The tendency to developmental change, which we call evolution, is justified by the fact that it is a general characteristic of biological entities. When the so-called struggle for existence is seen simply as an actuarial theorem, we have, in Waddington's words, a concept as unemotional as a definite interval, and the emotion disappears. With it disappears that preposterous idea of an external standard value which the emotion produced. And the actual tendency of events, said Mark, would still be self-justified, and in that sense, good. When it was working for the extinction of all organic life, of course, for the if you insist on formulating the problem in those terms. In reality, the question is meaningless. It presupposes a means and end pattern of thought, which descends from Aristotle, who in his turn is merely hypostasizing elements in the experience of an Iron Age agricultural community. Motives are not the causes of action, but it's by products. When you have attained real objectivity, you will recognize not some motives, but all motives as merely animal subjective economic. I see, sir. The philosophy which Frost was by no was expounding was by no means unfamiliar to him. He recognized it at once as the logical conclusion of thoughts which he had always hitherto accepted, and which at this moment he found himself irrevocably rejecting. The knowledge that his own assumptions led to Frost's position, combined with what he saw in Frost's face, and what he had experienced in this very cell, <coughs> effected a complete conversion. All the philosophers and evangelists in the world might not have done it so easily. And that, continued Frost, is why systematic training and objectivity must be given to you. After that, he took Mark from the cell, and they led him to a narrow little door with a pointed arch. Here he paused and said, go in. The room at first sight was an anticlimax. It appeared to be an empty community room with a long table, eight or nine chairs, some pictures, and oddly enough, a step <coughs> in one corner. A man of trained sensibility 
would have seen at once that the room was ill-proportioned, not grotesquely so, but sufficiently to produce dislike. It was too high, too narrow. Mark felt the effect without analyzing the cause, and the effect grew on him as time passed. Sitting, staring about, he next noticed the door, and thought at first that he was the victim of some optical illusion. It took him quite a long time to prove for himself that it was not. The point of the arch was not in the center. The whole thing was lopsided. Once again, the error was not gross. The thing was near enough to the true to deceive you for a moment and to go on teasing the mind, even after the deception had been unmasked. Involuntarily, one kept shifting the head to find positions from which it would look right after all. He turned around and sat with his back to me. One mustn't let it become a an obsession. Then he noticed the spots on the ceiling. They were not mere specks of dirt or discoloration. They were deliberately painted on, little round black spots placed on irregular intervals on the pale mustard colored surface. There were not a great many of them, perhaps 30, or was it 100. He determined that he would not fall into the trap by trying to count them. They would be hard to count. They were so irregularly placed a little blurry. Now that his eyes were growing used to them, and one couldn't help noticing that there were five in that little group to the right. Their range seemed to hover on the verge of regularity. They suggested some kind of pattern. Their peculiar ugliness consisted in the very fact that they kept on suggesting it and then frustrating the expectation was aroused. Suddenly he realized that this was another trap. He fixed his eyes on the table. Shiny that was, not quite round, and arranged apparently to correspond to the spots on the ceiling, or were they? No, of course not. Ah, now he had it. The pattern, which we call it a pattern on the table, was an exact reverse of that on the ceiling, but with certain exceptions. He found he was glancing rapidly back and forth, trying to puzzle it out. For the third time, he checked himself. He got up and began to walk about. He had a look at the pictures. And why were there so many beetles under the table of the last supper? What was the curious trick of lighting that made each picture look like something seen into a dream? When once these questions had been raised, the apparent ordinariness of the pictures became their supreme menace like the ominous surface innocence at the beginning of certain dreams. He turned his back on the pictures and sat down. He understood the whole business now. Frost was not trying to make him insane, at least not in the sense more he could have too given to the word insanity. Frost had meant what he said. To sit in the room was the first step towards what Frost called objectivity, the process whereby all specifically human reactions but after an hour or so in this long, high, coffin of the it began to produce on Mark an effect which his instructor had probably not anticipated. The built and painted perversity of this room had the effect of making him aware, as he had never been aware before, of the room's opposite. As the desert first teaches men to love water, or his absence first reveals affection. There rose up against this background of the sour and crooked, some kind of vision of the sweet and strange, something else, something he vaguely called the normal, apparently existed. He'd never thought about it before. But there it was, solid, massive, with a shape of its own, almost like something you could touch or eat or fall in love with. It was all mixed up with Jane and fried eggs and roots of caw and grew, pure hearted. And the thought that somewhere outside, daylight was going on at that moment. He was not thinking in moral terms at all. Or else, it was much the same thing. He was having his first deeply moral experience. He was choosing the summer. The normal. All that was 
was what he chose. If the scientific point of view what led away from all that, then be down to the scientific point of view. The vehemence of his choice almost took his breath away. He did not have such a sensation before. For the moment, he hardly cared the frost and the Till We Have Faces is Lewis's retelling of Ovid's story of Cupid and Psyche. This appears in The Golden Ass. He tells the story from the perspective of Oriel, who is the older half-sister in Lewis's retelling, the older half-sister of Psyche. Psyche has been taken away by the gods. And as the book begins, Oriel is making her accusation against the gods. And she writes out the story, her view of what has happened, uh, and her feeling, feelings with the gods. At the end of the book, she finally gets to state her case before the gods. 
in a kind of tribunal. And she gets to make her charge. And that's the passage that I'm going to read. Do you think we mortals will find you gods easier to bear if you're beautiful? I'll tell you that if that's true, we'll find you a thousand times worse. For then, I know what beauty does. You'll lure and entice. You'll leave us nothing, nothing that's worth our keeping or your taking. Those we love best, whoever's most worth loving, those are the very ones you'll pick out. It would be far better for us if you were foul than ravening. We'd rather you drank their blood than stole their hearts. We'd rather they were ours and dead than yours and made immortal. The girl was mine. What right had you to steal her away into your dreadful heights? You'll say I was jealous. Jealous of Psyche? Not while she was mine. That's why I say it makes no difference whether you're fair or foul. That there should be gods at all. There's our misery and bitter wrong. There's no room for you and us in the same world. You're a tree in whose shadow we can't thrive. We want to be our own. I was my own and Psyche was mine. And no one else had any right to her. Oh, you'll say you took her away into bliss and joy such as I could never have given her, and I ought to have been glad of it for her sake. Why? What should I care for some horrible new happiness which I hadn't given her and which separated her from me? Do you think I wanted her to be happy that way? Did you ever remember whose the girl was? She was mine. Mine! Do you not know what the word means? Mine! You're thieves, seducers. Enough, said the judge. <clears throat> there was utter silence all around me. And now for the first time I knew what I had been doing. Now I knew that I had been reading it over and over. For accusation. Perhaps a dozen times. I would have read it forever if the judge had not stopped me. And the voice I read it in was strange to my ears. There was given to me a certainty that this at last, was my real voice. There was silence in the dark assembly long enough for me to have read my book out yet again. At last, the judge spoke. Are you answered, he said. Yes, said I. The complaint was the answer. To have heard myself making it was to be answered. Lightly men talk of saying what they mean. When the time comes to you in which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all that time idiot-like, then saying over and over, you will not talk about joy of words. I saw well why the gods do not speak to us openly, nor let us answer. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we need? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? We have never told the whole truth. We may confess ugly facts, the meanest cowardice or the shabbiest and most prosaic impurity, but the tone is false. The very act of confessing, an infinitesimally hypocritical glance, a dash of humor, all this contrives to dissociate the facts from your very self. No one could guess how familiar and, in a sense, congenial to your soul these things were, how much of a piece with all the rest. Down there in the dreaming inner warmth, they struck no such discordant note. We're not nearly so odd and detachable from the rest of you as they seem when turned into the words. But though our Lord often speaks of hell as a sentence inflicted by a tribunal, he also says elsewhere that the judgment consists in the very fact that men prefer darkness to light and that not he but his word judges men. We are therefore at liberty to think of this bad man's perdition, not as a sentence imposed on him, but as the mere fact of being what he is. The characteristic of lost souls is their rejection of everything that is not simply themselves. Our imaginary egoist has tried to turn everything he meets into a province or appendage of the self. The taste for the other, that is the very capacity for enjoying good, is quenched in him, except insofar as his body 
still draws him into some rudimentary contact with an outer world. Death removes this last contact. He has his, his wish to lie wholly in the self and to make the best of what he finds there. And what he finds there is hell. I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful, rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. I do not mean that the ghosts may not wish to come out of hell in the vague fashion wherein an envious man wishes to be happy, but they certainly do not will even the first preliminary stages of that self-abandonment through which alone the soul can reach any good. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore self-enslaved, just as the blessed, forever submitting to obedience, become through all eternity more and more free. Our final way of celebrating Lewis uh, today, on the 50th anniversary of his death, is to engage in conversation. So if you have questions, comments that you'd like to raise, uh, either for the pa panel as a whole, or if you have uh, a question that you'd like to direct to a particular panelist, please, welcome. Anyone? Not all at once now. <laughs> about beauty and the role in education and the connection between beauty, education, and finding the truth, which is in the church. Another element, all the things that have been read and discussed this evening have a sense of immediacy to it. Lewis engaged so fully with the world of his time, and that's part of what makes it transcendent. Part of why Horace and I don't care that much for Hubert's Eucharist is that it's so engaged in the thought of the time and the, the fads, the intellectual fads of the time. So in terms of imagination, using it in apologetics, thinking about articulating in the here and now the truths that are eternal, uh, that can be very helpful. Use the imagination to find ways that use what's immediately accessible and make that the point of common ground. There, would be, there must be a different way of approaching it. I've heard somebody say that, for instance, they don't find mere Christianity that compelling because that person rejects the notion of justice. Well, but finding something that people do have an initial affinity to, even if they don't fully understand it. That might be a way of using the imagination. I'll add something to that. Lewis uh, has a little essay, I forget which book it's 
Livingston now on, on riding bicycles is the name of it. And he talks about how this, this connects to um, Forrest's uh, argument about this sense of longing that we have. And Lewis wants to say it's central to all of us, but he also says there's a natural progress, there's a natural procession uh, by which we become disillusioned of uh, what we, uh, it's almost like the experience that you were talking about, these successive um, moments where there's something out there and you achieve it and you realize, ah, oh, it's not that great. And he used the example of bicycle riding, which for a child who can't yet ride a bicycle is a beautiful and amazing thing that's right beyond uh, the limits of what you're allowed to do. But then, then of course, you, you get a bicycle and you're allowed to ride and, and you have that experience of joy, but then you, you ride a bike day after day after day after day and that experience becomes dry. And you have this experience of being disillusioned um, where, or disenchanted, actually, is the word that Lewis used. Where, where, where you were enchanted, that enchantment is shattered. And one of the things that Lewis really argues about uh, in all of the books that we've, that we've pointed to, all these, uh, especially these imaginative works, is that Lewis is suggesting that especially those who have been <coughs> disenchanted need to be re-enchanted. And imagination is a very powerful tool for doing that. And um, of course, that re-enchantment can take a lot of forms. It's often a matter of awakening a sense of something that you loved. And I think uh, Dana Menino's uh, reading was did, so, did that so beautifully about how she put it into a context of family and home. Um, but, but for each one of us, of course, and this goes to the point that Dr. Takash just mentioned about how um, imagination is always concrete and our experience of the world is so concrete that things are going to trigger that for one person that won't trigger it for another. And so um, that, that's in a way why I, I think one of the reasons that motivated Lewis to write in so many genres was he was fascinated by, by the, the task and possibility of awakening that enchantment. And it may be, you know, it may be for one person of a philosophical mindset, it may be the abolition of man. For, uh, for another person who uh, understands this, this sense that there's a reality beyond this one, it may be a novel like Till We Have Faces. It's almost, uh, it is a matter of training ourselves, though, to be, to be prepared to be enchanted, again, to be re-enchanted. Another question. Well, I, was, I wasn't going to ask this, but uh, someone a few years ago mentioned that uh, no one could take C.S. Lewis uh, to be a serious philosopher, and why anyone would study him in school would be, it's like, silly. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, no, it's, it's uh, I mean, he's a lightweight, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know what? I, I, I definitely differ with you. And I started going into, like you were saying, various genres and the concrete way that he does come across, and yet his um, the depth of, uh, you know, his uh, transcendental outlook along with all these other wonderful things. And I wonder if this um, celebrated panel could address that for us today. Dr. Clayton should. He teaches CS Lewis every year. <laughs> so if there's nothing there to teach, he's been ripping his students off. <laughs> You're asking me. There's no doubt but that Lewis's, his training, of course, was in philosophy. He hoped uh, initially to, uh, to teach philosophy uh, at Oxford. But um, the style of philosophy had already changed between the time uh, you know, he engaged in his studies and by the time he was ready uh, to be uh, a tutor. And um, the style of philosophy is 
well, it's, it's just very different, right, uh, that developed in, in uh, Anglo-American circles in the 20th century. And eventually, that caught up with Lewis. Uh, there's the famous uh, meeting of the Socratic Club at which uh, uh, Ms. Anscombe took him to task for his argument in, uh, in miracles concerning self-contradiction of the naturalist. And she's coming from the perspective of a Wittgenstein. And uh, Lewis never really engaged, after that time, I mean, he did go back and revise uh, the text of miracles and change that third chapter, but he never really engaged in a lot of uh, philosophical kind of work after that. Um, and I think the, the reason for that is he recognized that um, <coughs> the audience had changed, and he was not the one to be speaking uh, to, to the audience. That said, um, still Lewis points back, uh, as the uh, professor keeps saying throughout the Narniad, uh, it's, it's in Plato, it's all in Plato, right? What do they teach them in the schools? And so he points us back to the past, right? To the great philosophers of the past, Plato and Aristotle. Um, that are at the, at the beginning of the Western intellectual tradition. And one, one of the reasons I think we're looking at Lewis seriously as a philosopher, even though he's, he popularizes uh, and his style of doing philosophy is, is out of date perhaps. Um, nonetheless, one of, the, one of the reasons we're looking at, uh, at Lewis is this fact that he leads us on and we can understand more about what he himself does by understanding what Plato and Aristotle and Augustine and Aquinas and so forth said. And so um, he's a way of getting us, introducing us to that. I, I'm, and I'm, I'm surprised, uh, there was a collection, uh, you may remember about Calvin, but uh, the philosophers who found faith, or, there's a collection of essays by a number of prominent Anglo-American right. philosophers, mm -hmm. right. philosophers who believe, philosophers who believe, um, and how often these these are like they start out skeptics or something, right, uh, or completely disinterested in Christianity, and every one of them has converted. And it's interesting to see how often Lewis is converted. I mean, and these are these are top-notch academic, you know, contemporary philosophers who. They found something in Lewis. Yeah, it's not going to appear you know, in the Journal of Philosophy these days, but there's there's something there because he's still touching on the truth. And as long as you're still touching on the truth, it's, it's worth taking a look at and investigating. Does that kind of get at it? It helps, but although that the individuals that I'm thinking of probably would say, well, that's great for theology, but what about philosophy? And I guess I have to say, what is natural religion, but going back to philosophy, you know, so uh, in that sense, I'd say absolutely. Dr. Jared, you regularly teach Lewis as well. Uh, how would you answer that? Uh, I, I say exactly the same thing Brian said. Uh, he, I would say, Lewis himself would say, I'm not a professional philosopher. He says that all the time. And he'll say, I'm not a theologian. Here's just some ideas on the subject. And then they're usually the best ideas. <laughs> I mean, his day job was a literary critic, and that's where he wrote his, you know, his official writings, his professional writings. Um, but he does deal with basic philosophical issues. I, I have to admit, the class that I teach, uh, which I also teach every year, and it's a great place to get at other issues, and, and we use that as a springboard, for instance, to talk about the problem of evil talk about truths for God's existence and the moral argument, to talk about ethical relativism um, in the, from these different perspectives. But as far as professional philosophy, no, he's not. I'd have to agree with that. But as Brian says, he's getting at these kind of fundamental issues that philosophers have dealt with for years. He's doing it more in the medieval style. You know, I, I remember reading something that said that Lewis is really sort of postmodern in a way. Modernism thinks you can just take reason by itself. We can sort of take off our, our individual trappings and just the self can go find truth. Um, 
that, you know, you think of the, the scientist goes into a lab and they take off their cultural trappings, they put on the white lab coat, and they become scientist person. And they're not male science or female science or gay science or straight science or whatever. It's just science. And postmodernism is saying, you know, you really can't do that. You, you can't get away from the fact that you're male or female or from a big city or a small town, all those things that make us up the race, class, gender, etc. You can't get away from that. And I think Lewis was saying some of the same things. But where the postmodern says what we need to do is move forward past modernism, Lewis says, wait a minute, there was something back behind that that made sense. And the, the, the real argument I see, if you look at the mid medievals, they said, you can't have knowledge, real knowledge, unless it's grounded in something transcendent. The moderns come along and say, no, I can have real knowledge and ground it in myself. Think of Descartes, especially. Uh, but Bacon and others as well. And Lewis, postmodernists rather, I think are agreeing with the medievals and saying, it's true, you can't have real knowledge unless you ground it in something transcendent. Oh, and by the way, there probably isn't anything transcendent. Therefore, you can't have any real knowledge. And Lewis is agreeing with the premise, the first premise, but not the second. And he would say, yeah, medievals were right. So it's not philosophy, as you say, in the modern style. Of course not. But it's very philosophical, and I think it gets at these fundamental issues that have been around for ages. And really a sort of, uh, what would somebody call it, a restorative postmodernism. It says, yes, I hate modernism too. But the answer is to go back. <laughs> Maybe we could call it a, a post-medievalism. There we go. <laughs> One of Lewis's strangest books is The Discarded Image, where he says that, um, well, I'll, I'll put it in the bluntest, strangest way I can. He says, basically, we need to recover medieval geocentric cosmology. Now, that just, if I put it that way, it just sounds completely bizarre. Of course, Lewis, I mean, he wrote science fiction stories. He's not anti-scientist. He doesn't think we should go back and, and uh, assert that um, heliocentrism is false and, and Galileo was wrong or anything like that. That's not what he means. What he means is there is uh, power and beauty in the imagery of the cosmos that's, predict that, that's presented in, in medieval cosmology. And uh, there's, there's a now uh, famous thesis uh, by a guy named Michael Ward that the, the Chronicles of Narnia are indeed shaped by Lewis's love for medieval cosmology. And each of the stories in the series reflect uh, uh, one of the planets, the, uh, reflect the governance of one of the planets. And so it just shows that Lewis's imagination uh, and, so, and I think it illustrates one of the ways in which he is a philosopher, not in the technical sense, Dr. Clayton, and, and, and actually Dr. Beard mentioned too, not in the sense of um, uh, middle 20th century philosophy. He's a philosopher in the sense of what ideas engage us and what, what ideas point us toward the truth. In that sense, when you read a book like The Great Divorce and you see very clearly, he's a Platonist who thinks that image points us to reality, and uh, that's part of what's powerful about a book like The Discarded Image, where he's saying there, there's something in the image that can point us to some very powerful things, uh, some very powerful truths about ourselves and the world that we inhabit. Thank you. Yeah, Maybe time for one more question. Or even one more, I mean, an, another appropriate thing on this, uh, as, uh, as Dana Menino has suggested, this is Lewis Feast Day. So if you have a, a remembrance or, um, or your own encomium for Lewis uh, and you'd like to share that with us, please go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and, and I think that's a good example of Lewis doing moral psychology in the sense of what John meant it. Because um, I don't want to reveal too much about myself here, but I can read the letters and I can say, oh yeah, I, I do that. Yeah. Right? I think that way about things. And I can see the way in which I try to rationalize something or treat. I, I play this particular kind of game with people. I know exactly what's being talked about here. And I've actually had students in my ethics class in some semesters we read Screwtape just because it does get at this, the, this moral psychology, what it's like to think uh, in terms of virtues and vices. And even if you don't buy the, the stuff about the, the, the demons and all that, right? so you even set all that stuff aside, it still paints a, a, a portrait of what it's like to be a moral, a human moral agent and the kinds of games we play with ourselves. We are out of time. Uh, Dana, do you have a last word? You've been very, uh, very nice to uh, stay there. <laughs> stay there with our. Uh, any last word now? No, no, just thank you for, for being here. Okay. It's been wonderful to listen to all of the other panelists tonight. So thank you so much for, for having us out. Well, thank you for joining us from far away. Uh, I want to I want to thank everyone for coming. It's normally uh, our practice since I was dealing with technology issues here. We we have snacks and they're just <laughs> and besides it's uh, it's a day that we're remembering Lewis and uh, one way to celebrate Lewis would be to talk to chat. So if you don't have somewhere you need to go immediately, please stick around and uh, find uh, grab someone and and ask them a question or tell them what Lewis means to you. Uh, take a couple of minutes. Our last meeting will be uh, early in in uh, December. I forget which day. I think it's the fifth on a Friday, sixth. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. McClellan, who is retiring from the philosophy department, is going to be talking about the hiddenness of God. So that'll be a fine uh, a fine meeting to join us. Again, let's thank our speakers.